they made my life, our life, uh, worse than a nightmare. They destroyed us. They destroyed my family. And my only wish is that one day he can feel how it's like that someone takes, takes your baby, takes a lie to you, manipulates you. We were just muppets to them. They destroyed Xavier's image. Some friends believed what was writing in the press. For a year, Laura Giusto, the wife of Petrus Audi whistleblower, Xavier Giusto, has kept silent while her husband suffers in a crowded Bangkok jail. She had no choice, she says, because if she cooperated, he was promised freedom. If not, he could be killed. They moved him to better condition and they simply said to him, well, you can stay in these condition, help us and go out quickly or we can leave you and you go back to the worst part of the prison. You might get nine years and you might get killed because Malaysian wants to kill you or in the best case, extradite you to Malaysia. Now those are some very frightening threats. Were they made to you, to your husband or to both? To both. Because the Malaysian really wanted to hurt Xavier, that without them, he would be already dead. Behind those threats and promises were none other than Justo's former colleagues from the company Petro Saudi, says Laura, the very people who denounced Justo to the Thai authorities to begin with. Following his arrest, they astonishingly gained exclusive access to him in jail, where they offered to get him out, but only if he cooperated with their campaign to deny responsibility for stealing billions from Malaysia's development fund, 1MDB. But it was all lies, says Laura. She now accuses Petra Saudi of a shocking conspiracy to blackmail her husband into a confession and false statements in order to get him jailed, cover up their role and to protect the Malaysian Prime Minister, Najib Razak. I hope they pay for what they have done because this is beyond corruption and money laundering. There's threats, blackmail, playing with people's life, destroying family, friends, everything. They took everything from us. Orchestrating events was Patrick Marnie, a British director of Petra Saudi, who Laura confirms spent much of the last year managing Justo in Thailand. She also accuses the key shareholder, Tariq Abade, together with a team of British ex-servicemen who were hired by Petra Saudi to help frame and discredit her husband after he had revealed its pivotal role in Malaysia's 1MDB development fund scandal, which has triggered the biggest ever global money laundering investigation into the theft of billions of dollars. They confirmed that they paid everybody many times at very high level. Do you think that they are working together with the Malaysian government to persuade the Thai authorities to keep your husband as this unique prisoner? Right now, yes. I believe that they're working together to, to make Xavier stay in jail. When I look at all the situation from the beginning, I just believe that they made everything to make sure he would stay inside for the longest time ever. Why do you think they want him inside? because he's actually, and from many authorities, he's a key witness in this story. That's why. And what other best place than a Thai jail? Because you have no rule, no human rights, and they control everything, the prison, the authority, at the highest level. So there's nothing better than keep him in this Thai jail. Justo was previously himself a director of Petra Saudi, but had moved with his new wife from Europe to Thailand by the time the UK and Swiss registered company moved to denounce him last year for alleged extortion over their company's stolen data. He had been based here at Petra Saudi's office in London's Curzon Street, Mayfair, and was an old friend of Marnie and Abade. 
but he left on bad terms in 2011 after just one year, having realised there'd been massive fraud linked to its initial business venture with 1MDB. He took with him a copy of Petrosaudi's database, which detailed the entire criminal transaction, whereby at least two-thirds of a $1.8 billion investment by 1MDB had been siphoned out of its supposed joint venture with Petrosaudi into bank accounts controlled by Joe Lowe, a flamboyant young Malaysian who acted as Najib's proxy. Shortly after that money disappeared, Joe Lowe started attracting headlines for his extravagant spending. He began fating Hollywood stars in celebrity hotspots like Vegas, Monaco and New York. He bought a super yacht. Then he became linked to Najib's stepson, Reza, producer of the film Wolf of Wall Street, which Lowe reportedly funded to the tune of $100 million. Journalists, particularly Sarawak Report, have been questioning the source of this mysterious wealth and the growing debts at 1MDB, something that Justo's Petrosaudi data went a long way towards explaining. According to thousands of emails and documents, Jolo managed the theft with the willing collaboration of Petrosaudi directors who agreed to act as a front in return for huge kickbacks and an injection of over $300 million into the company. Those emails even contain pictures of the meeting between Lowe, Prime Minister Najib Razak and the Petro-Saudi shareholders Tariq Abade and the Saudi prince Turkey Abdullah as they made the deal on the yacht Tatouche in August 2009. Later, more billions were to go from 1MDB through other investments involving Joe Lowe. At least one billion has been traced back into the Prime Minister's own personal bank account in Kuala Lumpur. Najib claims that money was donated by an anonymous Saudi royal and he's forcibly closed all Malaysian investigations into the whole affair. He has not, however, been able to disguise an $11 billion hole in 1MDB's accounts, and that missing money was already creating an economic scandal by the time Justo decided to release his data. In early 2015, in Singapore, Justo handed copies of his devastating files to both Sarawak Report and the business paper The Edge. He had hoped to be paid $2 million for the explosive material, which represented money owed him by Petrosaudi, he says. But in the end, no money changed hands, and he returned to his beach house for the following three months as the story broke out and investigations were launched in Malaysia. It had created a major crisis threatening Prime Minister Najib Razak, who by then was revealed to have secretly assumed total control of the supposedly independent fund, working through Joe Lowe and bypassing the board of directors. For the Justos, this had been their safe place in paradise, but it proved a disastrous misjudgment by the couple. In June, the operation to arrest Savier was launched by his desperate and angry ex-colleagues, who'd guessed it was he who had released the data. Laura was visiting family in Geneva with their new baby. The arrest was all a setup. They came, there were at least a dozen of people. They just put him against the wall. He was really treated badly and then the next day they put him on a plane and brought him to Bangkok. Uh, they called already all the journalists they could. He was treated like he was a terrorist for a blackmail story. They made, they made it huge and purpose to make sure that they would blame my husband and that they would forget about Petro Sodi. By magic all the Malaysian Reporters were already there at the airport, ready to take Xavian pictures. Surrounded by special forces and some of Thailand's most senior generals, Justo was paraded before the cameras of the Malaysian government-controlled New Straits Times, which penned an aggressive article, painting Petra Saudi as an innocent wronged party in a blackmail attempt using allegedly forged data. What motivated this man, so disconnected from the nation of Malaysia, to launch such a callous attack on our people without a thought for the consequences? 
The answer appears to be cold, hard cash. Greed can be a route to riches, but it can also be a dangerous road to ruin, as Xavier Husto is learning the hard way. The paper then quoted a UK cyber security company which had been hired by Petro Saudi itself. The company alleged Sarawak report was politically motivated and had tampered innocent data. Independent IT experts Protection Group International, PGI, has confirmed that documents on the Sarawak report have been creatively altered. PGI's managing director, Brian Lord, had even been flown out to Bangkok by Marnie and he gave a series of further interviews to the Malaysian media alleging that the information published in Sarawak report had been altered from the original data, thereby accusing us of deliberate forgery and lies. It is incomplete data, creatively selected and edited to fit a desired narrative. These cases are all too familiar and we have unfortunately dealt with so many of them, where a greedy or malicious employee removes confidential data. Published data then invariably goes through selective editing and not infrequently plain forgery. In this case, what started out as a simple story of personal gain by a former employee became a story of politically motivated allegations through the use of irresponsible online blogs. A year on, PGI has yet to substantiate these and other allegations against Sarawak Report, despite promises that the company would provide proof after a forensic examination in supposed laboratory conditions. Brian Lord flew back to Britain and went silent after we disproved the only example he had given of alleged tampering by Sarawak Report. Sarawak Report has now obtained secret notes written by Justo in French, which were later smuggled to Laura from prison, detailing the circumstances of his arrest and later confession. These confirm that Patrick Marnie closely managed the entire operation, together with a paid British accomplice, a UK ex-policeman named Paul Finnegan, who was pretending to be working for London's Scotland Yard and used the false name of Paul Scott. Various things about my case, my arrest publicised, foreign press invited by Patrick and Paul. The day after my arrest, there was a visit to my home by Patrick and Paul. Forbidden to talk to my lawyer. Illegal. Paul Finnegan proposed that I should cooperate and serve less than six months, otherwise up to nine years in prison. My confession statement dictated by Paul. Lawyers paid by Patrick and Paul in Switzerland, Thailand and Singapore. Laura's travel and hotel costs to be paid by Patrick and Paul, also the Swiss lawyer. My confession statement was altered the day before the trial and sentence. Colonel altered my WhatsApp messages to Claire Rucastle Brown. Paul spoke about new identities and cash payment if I cooperated, for example, by purchasing my house. I must admit theft of records. Laura's phone is tapped. Records, including a daily report, are being sent to Malaysia by Patrick and Paul. There is a list restricting my visitors needing four signatures, including the prison governor. Visits only in the visiting room, which is bugged. Justo soon realised he was being held under unique conditions in the Thai jail. He was the only prisoner with a restricted list of people allowed to visit. Some close friends, but at the top of the list was Patrick Marnie. Back in Switzerland, Laura had first contacted Sarawak Report about her husband's arrest. Then she too found herself sucked into the conspiracy to blackmail Justo. So Laura, it's nearly a year since you and I got together and were able to talk. And I wrote a, an article to defend Xavier. And then later that day, you said you couldn't speak to me anymore. Um, what happened? Well, I had a phone call. Uh, from someone who was apparently called uh, uh, Paul Scott. He presented him, himself as a policeman working for the UK, willing to help Xavier, uh, telling me that he would do whatever it takes to help us. I asked him if he was working for Petro Saudi. This is one of my first questions to him, and he answered no. 
uh, he told me that uh, they needed some confession from Xavier and for me to believe that I asked him to talk with, uh, with Xavier so he said he would manage for him to call me uh, probably the next day or in the next two days to make sure I should trust him. It was very important that Xavier made some sort of confession. Yes. He asked me, even on the phone, he said he, he's going to help Xavier to confess. Otherwise, he would risk nine years of prison for what he did. Clearly, Petra Saudi knew that to keep Xavier in prison, they needed more than the evidence that they had. They needed that confession, didn't they? Yes. It was the next day or two days later, I received a phone call from my husband. Uh, usually phones are not allowed in the prison, but they managed to take Xavier in a private room and make him phone, phone me. And I could hear Xavier screaming and I could hear he was in a state that I never heard him like this before and really in panic uh, saying that I should do whatever they ask me, begging me to do whatever they ask me to do for his safety, for, for me, for our son. So actually he, he said he, he was willing to cooperate with this Paul Scott. And after this, that Paul Scott would manage to, to, yeah, to take him out of jail in only a few months. Paul phoned me back the same day, and he told me that uh, Xavier was keeping some hard drives apparently in a safe here in Geneva, and that I should give this back to him because it was not my property. If I didn't, he would risk nine years of prison and that they would arrest me for keeping these data. Who would arrest you? Paul Scott. At the time it was Paul Scott because... But what, what, what right did he have to come to Geneva and arrest you? Well, he said on the phone he had the legal rights to arrest me. And he was From sorry. where? From the UK police, he said that he had all the rights to arrest me, uh, that he would do so if I kept this, that it was completely illegal for me to, to have this, this hard drive and this computer with me. The files which Paul Finnegan, alias Scott, wanted contained the original Petra Saudi data from which Justo had passed copies to Sarawak report. At this stage, did your husband still appear to think that Paul Scott worked for Scotland Yard? No, I think at this stage he was still believing that he was uh, a British cop, a British policeman that had the rights. And the story of Paul was that he was in another case and that the Thai police asked him uh, to help them to get Xavier's confession because they couldn't get anything, they weren't speaking good English enough. So they asked for Paul, Paul's help. This is how apparently Paul Scott on my husband uh, on my husband's case. Then Paul Scott came to my husband, presented himself as a British cop, helping, willing to help. And apparently later I I understood that because Patrick Mauni was apparently willing to help Xavier because he didn't want him to spend many years there, he hired Paul to help us, to help my husband. That was the story? That, that was their story, yes. Do you believe it now? Absolutely not. You think that Paul had been hired by Patrick from the very beginning? Yes, I do. Now, has... Have you been able to, I know that every time you've seen your husband, Paul has been there at your side. Yes. So it's very difficult for you to talk to Xavier. Do you, do you know what he now thinks about what happened? Well, I'm sure he believes that this was, from the beginning, it was everything to frame him, to make a confession of many things that he didn't do. 
to to make sure that he would stay the the longest possible in jail. What this makes clear is that the man who interviewed Justo in jail and took his confession was a bogus British policeman who was in the pay of the very company which had denounced Justo to the Thai authorities. Paul Finnegan next flew from Bangkok to Geneva, where Laura did as her husband had begged, handing over two files of data at the airport. Um, later, uh, Paul made me understood that Patrick had everything under control and that he had the highest um, contacts in Thailand to make sure that my husband would go out from the back door of the jail within a few months when, every, when the story would calm down and when they would get what they wanted in the media. He saw with high general, he knows the colonel of the prison, everybody has been paid already, you don't have to worry about anything. So Patrick was paying the authorities to manage this case? Yes, everyone, everybody in Thailand. Did it seem odd that a British policeman was in the prison taking your husband's confession? Very odd. I couldn't believe it really, but after I heard my husband, to be honest, I didn't even think more. I just did as, as he asked me because it was desperate. Uh, I didn't have any Thai lawyer at the time, so it was difficult to ask for advice. And everything was already under control, so my, I didn't have the choice. I, I just had to follow what they asked me. Laura later discovered that Finnegan was hired by Marnie for the handsome fee of £500 a day. His first job, to retrieve all Xavier's original data, seemed successful. He knew I had this, this evidence. I know he could feel that I, I didn't want to give this because I knew this was Xavier's protection. And, well, he started to be really insistent and quite threatened on the phone, saying that I was not allowed to, to have this data, that it was not my property, it was Petro Saudi property, and uh, if I didn't give that back to him, that I would be arrested very, very soon. Obviously, why it was so important for them to have this data was that then uh, the only other data that would be out would be yours, would be mine. And, of course, they had a strategy for dealing with the data that I had got. Exactly. I, it took me a little while to understand what was their strategy, but I finally picked up that actually that was it. They just wanted to get all the proof, all the other data, and make you um, saying that you tampered all the data. To claim that I was tampering a everything documents. exactly so that way you couldn't be credible anymore and well that's it paul and his colleagues controlled laura's life for most of the following year traveling with her to thailand and supervising her visits to the jail to see her husband laura was also contacted directly by marnie who texted regularly and also met her in thailand six times to begin with, she says, the Petra Saudi team were kind and supportive as they tried to get her to do what they wanted. Actually, they were really, really nice to me. They said, don't worry, we will arrange everything. They paid me business class tickets with Thai Airways to, f to fly with Paul Finnegan directly to, the, to Bangkok. Then they organized private visits in a room. That was the carrot, wasn't it? Yes. They were paying for my travel and my hotels. He, they said that, no problem, we will help you later financially, we will help you to, to sell your house, we will buy it. Uh, they even said that it was so dangerous for us that they would provide us new identities once Xavier would be out. Um, a safe place in Europe and many other fabulous things. 
but underneath were threats and demands. First he had to confess, he had to do all these interviews. Patrick explained me that he was the only one that could help because Malaysian wanted Xavier for the information he got. He even told me that they wanted him dead, actually, because of what he knew, because of he was he could he was a witness and he could compromise everything. It was not just Xavier who had to cooperate, also Laura. They wanted some phone records from you. Uh, they wanted some interview. They wanted me to take a political position on this story. The position that they wanted me to take was their side, saying that Xavier, especially you, tampered all these documents. And that should be uh, what I should have tell the press. Why did they think it was so important to discredit me? Because I think that at first you were the only danger to them. So, yeah, you were the one that should take you down to make sure that, that no, no one would talk about, about them, about what it, they did. They told me that it was just a question of time before you were going to be arrested that you were in serious, uh, you, had, you will have serious problem for what you did. Well, actually it was on the strong advice of Paul that I couldn't contact you anymore. I should stop because you were a real danger, that you'll be the next one jailed. And that you were, yeah, that it was because of you actually that my husband was in jail. And, of course, I kept evidence because I could feel that they were lying, they were playing us. Uh, of course, you don't trust the people that put your husband in jail. But when I heard my husband, the panic, the, the, I could feel the, the pain he was in and it was terrible. So I, didn't, I really didn't have the choice just to follow his wish. I couldn't take any risk at this point, so I had to give back the data. I was thinking, I don't know what could happen to him if I don't. So Laura says she played along because she had no choice. Nevertheless, she collected as much evidence as she could about the conspirators who were controlling her and her husband. This includes numerous WhatsApp messages and emails sent by Finnegan, which confirmed that he was being paid by Marnie to manage the couple and make Laura do what they wanted. Read CRB's email slash texts. Hi Laura, please could you possibly send me everything you have had from CRB, all her communications to you so that I can read them and formulate a strategy to deal with her. Once you hear back from her, we will consider a meeting with her that will be carried out under covert surveillance conditions. I will prepare a document for you to use as an aid memoir and a guide to maximise the intelligence or evidence from everything she says to you. You now fully know what I used to do for a living, so if we go down this route, I will ensure your safety and anonymity so that you will not be compromised or incriminated. It's definitely worth pursuing and exploring further and too good an opportunity. Please let me know when you hear back from her and in the meantime, send me what you have. Best wishes, Paul. To assist in these operations, another British citizen was employed by Petrus Saudi called Dave Thomas. The former SAS soldier runs a company named Spy Games, and claims he is expert in secret filming. They wanted me to call you and put cameras at my parent place, wires, everything, make you talk and spy on you. So they wanted to secretly record me? Yes. And they wanted to entrap me into saying things that they could use against me? Yes. Hi, Laura. I have asked Patrick to get an official legal opinion on the tactic we are proposing with Claire Rucastle brown and he will also liaise with you on this. We would like you to call her, record it, and say you're going to see Xavier this coming Friday. Ask her to meet you at your parents' home. If she agrees, I will come to see you tomorrow to prepare with you. This individual needs to be dealt with for everybody's sake. I take it no answer from her yet. Is it normal for her to be slow to reply? It's bank holiday here today, so that could be a reason. 
although this person is not a normal person, so she's probably on the move trying to ruin somebody else's life somewhere. Hi, Laura. It's probably about time to call CRB. Just record it. You know what to say, as per my previous texts. You were going to Bangkok on Friday and need to discuss with her what help she can give and how to get Xavier out of prison, etc., as well as what she wants you to say to him. Any update at all, please, Laura? That's a bit odd. Still, let's not jump to any conclusions. If you could try again early tomorrow and let me know, we need to keep up momentum on her. Laura had in fact deliberately avoided contacting me, although she pretended that she had. Nevertheless, the team had already pressed her to make one phone call, which she did record on the promise that it would not be made public. Patrick asked me to call you and to record it. So I heard from you suddenly, unexpectedly. You were asking me all the time about this money thing, weren't you, I remember? This is the key point of Patrick told me that I should make you talk about the money, about our, all kind of things. But he made me write a few questions and key, key words that I should ask you. And he said it was only to listen to you to know what kind of woman you were, to make sure he could have a strategy on you later. That recorded conversation was later used by Marnie to make an attacking video. That Thai lawyer will have been approached. Laura said that this was not what she'd agreed and she refused to allow Petra Saudi to distribute the video, saying she would go public if they did. This became a growing dispute between her and Patrick Marnie, who wanted her to agree to release the video and to do interviews attacking me in the media. Managing the black media campaign was Swiss PR man Mark Kamina, a friend of Patrick Marnie's. Meanwhile, Paul kept charge of events at the prison for Petra Saudi. Well, first to move someone from the really worst part of the prison to the best part, then you can see already the influence they had because they managed everything in the prison. So visiting, conditions, um, any supply of food, drink, uh, exercise, everything. Um, later, uh, Paul made me understood that Patrick had everything under control and that he had the highest um, contacts in Thailand. But Patrick Maoni managed to get me and reporters uh, and himself. Of course, when he wanted to talk to Xavier, he went directly in the prison. Xavier is the only one in maybe five or six thousand prisoners that, that has a visitor list. And if you're not on the list, well, you cannot go and see him. Even if you are on the list, actually, it sh the, the authorization must be signed by three, three guards, three colonels at the prison directly. So I used to go there. The first one would sign it if he was there. After I should go to the second one. If he wasn't there, I used to wait sometime for hours. Sometimes I waited six, seven hours to see him 20 minutes. Laura says details and recordings of every visit were sent to Petra Saudi and Malaysia. Scores of texts confirm what was going on. Hi Paul, I have an appointment at 11 o'clock to go and see Xavier. Patrick told me to present myself at the desk beside the entrance gates, so I hope I'll be able to see the lawyer soon. Please contact Mr Chak. He is a Secretary of Prison Commissioner. Tell him that you're the wife of Mr Xavier and would like to visit him. Once Petra Saudi had got the copies of the data, Laura says they forced Xavier to make a confession that incriminated himself, without which it is unlikely that the Thai court would have had the evidence to convict him of the charges being pressed by Petra Saudi. They asked my husband to accuse himself about many things that he didn't do, uh, to accuse you um, about tampering documents, which, of course, was not true. Um, they promised for him to be safe and out within a few months. They asked him to go to the press and make some interview, which every time was guided by Patrick's Maoni 
his friend, Mark Comina. Uh, they managed all the press, all the question, answer 48 hours always before the interview. It was Finnegan who drew up the confession for Justo, boasting how he'd used his British police training to make sure it was professionally put. On each page of this confession, Finnegan repeated that Xavier had refused his right to have a lawyer present as he made a damning self-indictment. This confession was released to all the Malaysian and Swiss press. I hereby confess to my full involvement in the attempted blackmail and attempted extortion of Petro Saudi. I make this confession of my own free will and accord without any pressure, duress or outside influence. I do not wish to have a lawyer present. I fully admit my criminal behaviour and accept my guilt in these matters. I just want to set the record straight and apologise to those who I have wronged. I have conspired with others and further admit offences of theft of data, handling stolen goods, selling stolen data and IT equipment to third parties and attempting to launder the proceeds of sale. My only motivation for selling the data that I stole was for monetary gain and I never considered myself a whistleblower. Sarawak Report asks on what authority an ex-British policeman was able to take a confession from a prisoner in a Thai jail without a work permit in the absence of correct officials and with no lawyer present. It was of course the worst possible advice for Savier to agree to make a confession without a lawyer particularly a confession written by the paid agent of the party which had denounced him in the first place. The Hustos soon realised that far from providing a backdoor out of jail, this deadly cooperation with their vengeful accusers produced disastrous results at the trial in August. Justo's self-damning confession earned him a three-year sentence based entirely on his own evidence. What did you do when you heard? I collapsed. So you realised you'd been betrayed yes. at that moment? Yes. And I couldn't do anything. Xavier's smuggled notes from jail tell his side of what happened. The lawyer did not represent me properly in court. The Thai lawyer did not turn up at the trial. Prison governor, the colonel, at criminal suppression department and Bangkok police chief are paid off by Patrick and Paul. I am obliged to make false statements about myself and past actions and also accuse others of bad actions, Claire, etc. I know the real facts very well, but I have to say I don't know them. Patrick and Paul said I have to claim there was falsification of the Petro Saudi records. Persons I must incriminate Claire, Tong, K. Tat, editor of The Edge, Mahatia, Anwar, Anwar family. Persons to avoid mentioning, Jolo and Najib Razak. Verdict on the same day as trial. That never happens. However, Petra Saudi still needed to use the Justos. They told Laura that the sentence was just for show and that Savier would be out before Christmas if she cooperated further. Laura must agree to release the video they'd made using her recorded phone call, they urged, WhatsApp messages and calls from Patrick Marnie made to Laura in French confirm these demands and why. Je voulais que tu sois au courant que cette vidéo a été faite. Ne réponds juste pas si elle t'appelle. I just wanted to let you know that the video has been made. Just don't answer if she calls you. We wanted to send it to all the people who subscribe to Solara Report. We have a list of all the emails. After that, we think it should be all over Malaysia. La cause de tous nos problèmes, elle doit perdre crédibilité. It's going to be all over the media out there. She is the cause of all our problems. She needs to be discredited. Patrick wrote to me and said, this is what I want to take out to make sure she has no more credibility. And this would show Najib and his party that Xavier and I was, were standing on his part, on his side. So by, by doing this thing against me, to attack me, and, and to put this movie out everywhere, in the mainstream media and in Malaysia, yes. Patrick said you would thereby be showing Najib Razak, the Malaysian Prime Minister, that you could be trusted if you were let out of jail. Is that, is that, is that the point? Yes, meaning that it was him who kept Xavier inside of jail, paying for him to stay in jail. 
For the same reasons, Xavier was also being forced to do a number of newspaper interviews from his jail cell. The PR agent managing this public relations exercise was a Swiss, Mark Camina. Uh, Patrick told me that he was one of his best friends. Uh, Mark Camina told me the same, that Patrick was a really good friend of him. And Mark Camina actually was hired through the Swiss lawyer that Xavier had, Mark Onslan. Actually, it's Patrick who hired uh, the Swiss lawyer. Uh, Mark Onslan told us that he was willing, of course, to work in the best interest of Xavier, but Patrick was paying the lawyer because, of course, we couldn't afford a lawyer like this. And then uh, Mark Onslan, the Swiss lawyer, hired Mark Comina to, to take care of all the interview, the press with Xavier. Marc Aslan has publicly denied that he was paid to defend Husto by Petra Saudi, the very people who put his supposed client in jail. However, in an email sent last December, he admitted the fact and himself refers to the blatant conflict of interest. Thank you for the update on the Singapore proceedings. We defer to Petra Saudi for the payment of the requested security for costs of 28th of December 2015. The fact that we are not in a position to supervise the Singapore proceedings or the information provided by Xavier puts us in a difficult situation and increases liability exposure, not to speak of potential conflicts of interest. So perhaps little surprise that it was Marc Anselin who gave a damning interview to Switzerland's Le Ton newspaper, supposedly on behalf of his purported client, Xavier Justo, but destroying his reputation at the same time. Under the headline, My Client Feels He's Been Used and Manipulated, Anselin denied that he was being paid by Petra Saudi, and he trashed his supposed client, saying of Justo, All that interested him was to be paid. He is not, and never was, a whistleblower. His motivation was purely financial. At that time, he still had no clear idea of what the data contained. He believes he is the collateral victim of a political conspiracy. Anzalan went on to attack Sarawak Report for being politically motivated and claimed we doctored what he described as innocent documents from Petra Saudi. Meanwhile, Laura confirms Anzalan's PR colleague Mark Kamina made a number of trips to Bangkok to organise further interviews with selected media with Justo in jail. Here again, Justo was instructed to publicly criminalise himself in order, says Laura, to satisfy the Malaysian Prime Minister. He told me that uh, the, Prime Minister, the Prime Minister didn't know Xavier or me, so he should be absolutely sure on which side we were. We should show them which side we were. This is what Justo was quoted saying in a second Le Ton article after one of their journalists gained access to the jail. I've done something illegal, but also disgusting, because I betrayed my friends. I think about it every minute. The damage that can be done when taking a decision without thought to the consequences is appalling. A minor decision can destabilise a country. Xavier Husto said he never wanted to cause a wave of protest against the Malaysian government. It was a huge deal. I thought it was a public interest to show these documents. He added that he did not see anything illegal in the hundreds of documents he examined from the database. Sarawak Report later noted that a senior editor involved in the stories was a close friend of Mark Kamina. Meanwhile, in his hidden notes to Laura, Xavier was smuggling out a very different version of events, confirming that he had indeed discovered evidence of a massive theft of $700 million from 1MDB in the original files from Petra Saudi. With regard to the payment of the first billion in September 2009, 700 million went to Coots under cover of repayment of the debt. Patrick and Tarek confided to me that there had never been such a debt, but this was the way in which to pay Najib and Jolo. But despite agreeing to lie for Petra Saudi, Justo was no nearer getting out of jail. An appeal failed. However, Marnie was still promising a release before Christmas. Recorded conversations between Laura and Marnie confirm it was Petra Saudi who commissioned operations such as the Facebook site called The Real Claire Rue Castle, which was sponsored in Malaysia. These attack sites used numerous fake Twitter and Facebook accounts to launch accusations against Sarawak Report. They used stolen identities 
often of people who were dead for disguise. But as Petro Saudi's attacks increased on Sarawak report, global regulators increased their pressure on Petro Saudi. The firm was claiming publicly that they were not under investigation. However, messages from Patrick Marnie to Laura Giusto make plain that he was being repeatedly interviewed by the Swiss and US authorities. My lawyer has a meeting shortly with the Swiss prosecutor and we're preparing for this meeting. Bad meeting with the prosecutor. The Swiss are continuing to really give a shit. They know they have nothing, but they say they are fearful of being accused of not doing anything. They just want to sit on this dossier. As the pressure increased, in November, Marnie started to become ever more insistent that Laura must release the video and also do newspaper interviews to be organised by Mark Kamina. He called her. They spoke in French. Our lawyer went to the Swiss prosecutor and he says, because of media, we're going to sit on it and I know it's fucking media fucking us. But Xavier confessed. Why don't you complain against Claire? She managed to put herself under police protection, manipulating everyone. She's scared and angry. Our next strategy is to get something into the bigger media on her, something that's going to come out in Malaysia. I'm going to ask you again to do something in the media, because your conversation with her must come out. We must be able to hear her words. I don't want to get involved. It's not right. Would you ask your wife to do this? Of course I would. You're defending your husband for the media? You're the poor little wife? You can show the media she's a bitch and the reason as Xavier is in prison, not us. You, on the other hand, are a poor victim. It's a good position and they can never turn this on you because you're the poor little wife. I'm going to make you into the victim for sure. Both of you, victims. I just want the answer. When is Xavier going to come out? Look, I told you last night who's controlling this. I'm going to have a meeting within the next few days and this guy has an ultimate nightmare that Xavier could turn on him if he gets sad. This is his position at the moment. So what do I say to Xavier? You told me December. This guy is still stressed. It's his political career on the line. He's in deep shit and that's all he thinks about. So what do I say? The only way I can show him that you're on his side, a team player, is that you're ready to put yourself in the media. You must denounce all the people that are making conspiracies against him. So what guarantees for Xavier? Look, for the moment this guy doesn't know you and you're the enemy. I'm not going to lie to you. You can help or not help. But you told me he would be out for December. I didn't promise. I'm going to do everything I can, but I never promised. We both thought you did. I'm still living shit every day because of you. I know he's in prison and you're alone with a kid. We're all in deep shit. I told you the other day, I'm in deep shit, and a prime minister of a country is in deep shit also because of that. Yes, but he is in prison. But he didn't have to do that. You said he would go out by the back door. Yes, but I didn't say in December. I said as soon as possible. We're all in deep shit only because of the media. The last time he did Le Temps, you said this would be the last time. Well, sadly, things didn't turn out the way I thought. This is something different, and I'm not asking Xavier to do something. I'm asking you to do something. I asked you to make this recording and told you one day I will ask you to use it. No, it was only to listen, and you went behind my back and made a cartoon. I have everyone to manage. I have you, Xavier, the Malaysians, the Thais, my wife, my kids, every day. Someone is asking me when this is going to finish. It was not me that started this. Now it's everyone in the media, the prosecutor. I do this 24-7. I don't think about anything else, and you're a part of this. I'm never going to force you, of course. I just want your help. I'm not like this bitch who promised you $2 million. You promised me he would never do three years. Laura, I do this and that for you. Visits, paying people to protect you and your husband. You can stop. Okay, I'll stop. This is 24-7. I'm living this shit, nothing else is on my mind. This can help, but you shouldn't take this as a negotiation to get Xavier out. Cooperate and let's see what happens. What's she going to do? Write in her blog that you shouldn't record her? She'll look even more of a bitch. All she can do is write a blog, she can't complain. But Laura Giusto chose not to cooperate. She threatened to tell all if the video was released and she refused to do media interviews for Patrick Marnie, organised by Mark Kamina. In January, Marnie sent Paul Finnegan to tell Laura that Petrosadi would no longer try to supposedly help Xavier. They were leaving him to rot after all. The Swiss lawyer, Mark Anselm, complained he was no longer being paid and dropped the couple's case and the suit which had been supposedly on behalf of Justo in Singapore. Paul nicely told me that they were going to stop helping. 
I mean, I don't know what help he was talking about because nothing of their promises was done. And that I was now alone. And when I got angry and I, I threatened them to go to the newspaper and tell the whole truth, he said that this could be the worst idea ever. And he just went on after saying that when I would be back to Thailand, I would probably be interviewed by the local police and by the Malaysian. And when I said it, it made no sense why. He said, we can find a reason why. We can? Yes, we can. As so Patrick and Paul. They could arrange for you to be interviewed by the Thais and Malaysians. Did, did they imply that that could include you being incarcerated like your husband? Of course, yes. And when I asked for what, he said complicity. What about the safety of your husband if you spoke out? They made me understood that this would be a really, really bad idea for, for Xavier. The worst idea too. Why? Because he could be easily hurt or change part of the prison or be even isolated. Uh, the condition has now changed already. It's 45 degrees over there. They have no fan. Um, they are allowed to eat only until 3 o'clock in the afternoon and nothing else until 7 o'clock in the morning. And even the water supply is, is limited by one liter a day, I think. By cooperating with Petra Saudi and Patrick Mani, has it made Xavier's position better? No, 10 times worse. Actually, a few days before his judgment, I asked Patrick to change his, his Thai lawyer, but he said, no, no way, don't worry, everything is under control, you shouldn't change his lawyer, everything will be fine. So we didn't have even uh, a fair defense. Well, the lawyer didn't come to court, did he? No, he didn't. He sent his assistant. The Justos have made a decision. Laura has sold her house and fled from Thailand, and she will battle for her husband from abroad. They are telling the truth to the world, and they've reported Petra Saudi and their accomplices to the UK authorities for their conspiracies, impersonations and lies.